Hey, welcome to the Weekend Experience. I'm so glad that you're joining us today. My name is Ben, and we're gonna jump into a new conversation where we're looking at something that is extremely applicable to the cultural moment that we are in right now. But before we do that, let's go ahead and sing together. Hey, Grace Church, good to be with you guys. Do you guys sing with us uh, wherever you're at? Every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion, you are my hiding place. I believe you are the way, the truth. The life I believe you are the way, the truth, the life I believe through every blessing, every promise, every breath I take. You are the one I love, oh. I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. think about uh, just this year. Um, there's just a lot that goes on in kind of our hearts and minds. I was on Facebook for a couple months this year, and and you quickly can just kind of see, you know, what is on our minds, what's on our hearts, what's kind of distracting us, uh, what's kind of pulling our attention. And I think just as we, as we sing these songs together, um, that it really, the heart of it is that we might refocus on just the truth of the gospel. And we say that often, but I just think about the things, uh, as things that work us up, our fears, uh, our distractions, whether it's politics, whether it's global viruses, whether it's financial things, whether it's relational things, all these different things that can kind of pull from our hearts. I think that it robs us of our peace, right? And that in our pursuit of all these things, we're trying to find peace in the situation, whether it's a financial situation, whether it's a health situation, some global craziness, whatever it is, that we're trying to find peace in those things. And I think in Colossians, Paul writes to the church, you know, he says, let the peace of Christ dwell in your hearts. 
and he encourages the church to sing together. And we're just going to sing a familiar song, uh, Cornerstone. And as we sing this song, we always want to kind of set Christ in our hearts. And as we sing the song, I'd encourage you to kind of, as we do this, to set Christ in our hearts, that we might find the peace of Christ, that the peace of Christ might dwell in our hearts. That whether it's, whether it's a global pandemic, whether it's this crazy political season, work stuff, relational stuff, whatever is kind of stirring up in your heart, I'd encourage you just to listen to the words of this song, to maybe pray uh, while we play this song. Maybe watch the sermon, come back afterwards and listen to the song. But pray that the, the peace of Christ might dwell uh, in your heart. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest faith, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Hey, good to see you this weekend. So glad that you're joining us. And I uh, want to say hi to those who call Norton Campus their home of Grace Church. 
And then there's a bunch of you we're hearing from that don't. And so we're glad you're joining us, uh, some of you from other states. And so glad we have this medium to get together. It's been a weird year. For those of us in Ohio, uh, that weird year is evidenced by the fact that Browns are four and one, right? Uh, but it is a weird year. Uh, here we are in October already, right? And so there's a big things going on in October. October 31st is coming up. Uh, that is the... Ohio State Buckeyes versus Penn State, but really here, that's Fall Festival on Wheels. Hopefully, if you're in the Akron area, you'll take advantage of that. I also just wanted to say this. This weekend, we are opening up three, fours, and five-year-olds. So we are beginning classes for them. And so looking forward to families coming back. First weekend in November, nursery. And so little by little, things are shifting. So in the month of October, a lot going on here. One of the things I want to talk to you about is this. We want to start a brand new conversation. Going to start it Today, this weekend, we're going to start a brand new conversation in an Old Testament book, the book of Daniel. And so you might want to find the book of Daniel, get that open, go to the table of contents, it's the easiest way to get there. Lay it in your lap, get a pen, paper, get your app, however you take some notes, because there's some things I think that are worthwhile writing down. Uh, Pastor Aiden and I are going to lead you through this conversation for the next six weeks. And the reason we're going to do that is simply this, that there is a cultural shift taking place. There is a cultural dialogue going on. It's not something that has just started in 2020, right? This cultural shift and dialogue's been taking place. I would say some of the events of 2020 have only amplified it, right? Intensified it. But there's a cultural shift going on. Like it or not, it's happening. Here's what I would say. If you're watching this, you're a follower of Christ, I just want you to hear me say this. If you're a follower of Christ, you're somebody who takes the Bible seriously, this cultural shift that's going on simply is this, is that little by little, we, those who are followers of Christ, are the minority. So why don't you hear me say this, right? We are slowly becoming more and more so the minority. So here's what I, what I think about. When I think about that, it creates a tension because people, the church, people who are followers of Christ, they try to find different ways to react to that. Uh, that cultural reality that I mentioned causes some Christians or Christ followers to react in a way that they wage war against the culture, Right? So they protest, they become angry, right? Uh, they they want to make war and contend with the culture. Uh, I would say this, to no avail, right? Because it's only led many people in our culture to think that evangelical Christians are just angry and opinionated, right? Uh, other, I would say, Christians, uh, this cultural moment has caused them to try to accomplish Christ's command by somehow attaching themselves primarily to a political platform or person. And I would say to no avail. What I mean by that is this, it's created cynicism. Uh, there's a book called Onward written by a guy named Russell Moore and he says this, when the Christian position on everything just happens to line up exactly with the favored candidate or political party, how can we not, he says, expect cynicism from those who naturally suspect that God simply means our team, right? And so that's the way some people try to, try to engage this cultural moment. Others, it's led to isolation. Uh, that we make the word Christian in adjectives. We have Christian dances, Christian movies, Christian clubs, Christian coffee, Christian everything Christian, right? So we create a subculture. And I would say to no avail. It's created our culture to think that somehow we're disinterested. Maybe even weird, I don't know, right? And then I would say there's another path. Some have chosen the path of assimilation. You know what that is? Uh, there are many Christians who have chosen the path of assimilation where there's virtually no difference. People can see no difference. In fact, many people in their life have no idea that they're even a Christ follower. Uh, same guy, Russell Moore, and I would commend this book to you, Onward is the name of the book, says this in his book Onward, a church that loses its distinctiveness is a church that has nothing distinctive with which to engage the culture. A worldly church is of no good to the world. That's what he says. Now, now here's what I know. This moment I'm describing to you is nothing new and the church and followers of Christ trying to figure out how to engage in this moment uh, a president of a Christian seminary, Al Mohler, said this, Christians in America are undergoing a huge shift 
in the way we see ourselves in the world. He says this, we are on the losing side of a massive change that's not gonna be reversed in all likelihood in our lifetimes. Christians must adapt to the changed cultural circumstances, doesn't stop there, by finding a way to live faithfully in a world in which we're gonna be a moral exception. That's what the book of Daniel is all about. <laughs> That's why I'm saying all that. That's what this book is all about. The Bible over and over again says this, that for followers of Christ, we are exiles, we are aliens. All I'm saying by that is this, is that this is not our permanent home. The Bible never calls this our permanent home. And so it says that we are exiles. And the story of Daniel is extremely relevant because in this cultural moment that we find ourselves, the book of Daniel is all about living a gospel-centered life of faith and conviction in a culture that doesn't always share that faith and conviction. It's all about how you and I can live as engaged exiles in a culture without conforming to that culture while still maintaining an influence in that culture. So key. So this story, Book of Daniel, you have your Bibles open, is of one primary guy, but actually four Hebrew young men, right, who did exactly that in their own cultural moment. If you have your Bible open, just look at it with me. We're gonna read the story through and make some observation. And then at the end of all this, I think I wanna draw out a couple principles that might help us. Daniel 1, verse 1, here's what it says, if you're with me. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, that's kind of fun, right? You can name your kid that, right? King of Judah. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Let's stop for a minute and just give you a little context. Where are we at here? Well, if you want the story of the Bible, maybe a lot of you have heard of King David, right? King of Israel. He had a son, King Solomon. And then Solomon had a son, Rehoboam. And what you need to know is that when Rehoboam became king, all of a sudden a civil war broke out. And Israel literally split north and south. North was called Israel, south was called Judah. Now, when you read the history of the north, they basically abandoned worship of the true God. Their kings were evil kings, bad kings, right? Just turn their backs on God. And what you find in their history is Assyria takes them captive about 722 BC. Judah, the southern kingdom, on the other hand, they were kind of a yo-yo kingdom, right? They had some kings that were devoted to God, some that weren't. So they were a yo-yo kingdom. And so when the northern kingdom went into captivity, Judah was spared for a time. But eventually it kind of caught up with them, right? Eventually it kind of caught up with them. And when you get to Jehoiakim, you find a king literally in Judah who Jeremiah 36, write that out and look this up, who when presented with God's word, he threw it in the fire. He totally ignored God's word. And so all of a sudden, then you have Babylon coming and besieging it, right? Judah literally was right in the middle of the Assyrian Empire, the Egyptian Empire, and to the east was the Babylonian Empire. And Babylon is coming to take over. And in you enter this character named Nebuchadnezzar, and he is not a good fellow. Write down in your notes somewhere, 2 Kings 25. I mean, he was a guy who was looking to take over the known world. Here's what I want you to know. It's gonna help Daniel make sense. I want you to write this down. First and foremost, Babylon was a real place, right? At a real time that opposed the real people of God. Babylon, as we talk about it here in verse one, was a real place, right? I can tell you this, that Babylon was in where modern day Iraq is. It was the zenith of civilization at the time. It was the largest known city in the world at that time. Some 200,000 people, 2,500 acres, 80 feet thick wall, almost 60 miles long, 320 feet high. You entered through the gates of one of their gods, like the Ishtar Gate. It was known for its opulent wealth, this artistic brilliance, uh, the Ziggurat Tower, seven stories high, that represented the, the, the religious uh, society, so to speak. Babylon was a real place. But here's what I want you to know. It's gonna make sense of where we're going. It wasn't just a real place, but Babylon's an accurate picture for all time. 
that represents any culture that dismisses God. You can trace it clear back to Genesis 11 that Babylon is this metaphorical picture of a society that literally turns its back on time. And that picture you can see clear to the end of God's story, the book of Revelation. Daniel and his friends are exiles in this real Babylon. And they're examples of how to live in a metaphorical Babylon. Well, how? Well, I think the very first thing we see is Babylon's strategy as a culture to somehow conform these four Hebrew teenagers. Daniel's 15 at the time this is starting out. He's 15, somewhere in that vicinity. And we begin to see Babylon's strategy to conform them. Look what it says, verse 2. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. What's going on? Nebuchadnezzar besieges Jerusalem and what he's doing is showing off. He kind of shows us the first part of Babylon's strategy, intimidation, right? What he's trying to show in front of the Hebrew people is my God's better than your God. Your God's weak. Your God's impotent. Your God's irrelevant. Your God's losing. That's all he's trying to do. It's this, it's this strategy of intimidation. It goes on, verse three. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz. Man, you find all kinds of names for your kids, right? Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. This was their strategy. So they would bring all the young uns. In verse four, it says, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. Gals, that sounds like a dating site, right? Imagine guys like that. And he says, he was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. What's going on here? They literally went and they swept Jerusalem and they brought out all the young'uns and the cream of the crop. What are they doing with them? They're isolating them. They're literally taking them away from the glue of their community. They literally are taking them from their homes, their families, their temple, their place of worship. And so there's an intimidation. Then there's this isolation that goes on. It doesn't stop there. Like he says, verse four, he was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. Teach them the way of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, and they were to be trained for three years. And after that, they were to enter the king's service. What's going on here? It's just part of the strategy, right? Intimidation, isolation, and then enculturation. They're just trying to enculture them. Teach them the way of the Babylonians. And then they bring before them and put a spread of the king's food, probably served with female companionship, right? And, and, and they literally are beginning to appeal to the ambitions and appetites so that they can almost do this kind of social engineering, right? Like we want to teach them. We want to give them the best that we have. To, we want to buy into the Babylonian dream. We want to teach them the Babylonian way. It's interesting. Well, they're not done. Verse six. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah. Daniel Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And then look what happens. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, Belteshazzar, Hananiah, Shadrach, Mishael, Meshach, and Azariah, Abednego. What's going on here? Literally, they're not just intimidating, isolating them, taking them away from everything they know enculturating them, want to somehow uh, get them to buy into the Babylonian way and the Babylonian dream, but there's this identification and they want to give them new names. Here's how significant that is. Daniel, his name literally meant, Hebrew name meant, God is my judge. Belteshazzar, the name they gave him, now the Babylonian god, Bel, he, you are a prince of Bel. The name Hananiah means this, whom God favors. The, the name Shadrach they gave Hananiah was, now you're under the command of the moon god. Mishael, who compares to my god? 
Meshach, the name they gave him, who compares to Shech, the God, the Babylonian God? Azariah, Jehovah helps. Abednego, you are now servant of the fire God. You see what's going on here is this, they are literally renaming, trying to get them to live from a different identity. Here you have four Hebrew young men exiled in the middle of a real Babylon. And can I just say this, that in the middle of this real Babylon, they become an example for how exiles live in the middle of a metaphorical Babylon, where the very same strategies take place. And they begin be, become an example for how you and I can begin to live in a way that isn't conformed to a culture, but still is able to engage a culture, to influence a culture. Well, how does that happen? Well, let's read the rest of the story. And then let's make some observation. Verse eight, but Daniel resolved. I love that. Some of your versions might he purposed in his heart. That's the Hebrew, like he made this determined purpose in his heart, not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Uh, that food was probably offered to their Babylonian gods. It broke Jewish dietary laws, and it represented a lifestyle. And Dan's like, I don't know. I'm going to purpose in my heart. Now, God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord, the king. Nebuchadnezzar is a bad guy. Second Kings 25, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? Like, if I do what you're asking, you might not look so good and I might lose my head. <laughs> the king would then have my head because of you, verse 11. Daniel then said to the guard, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. Verse 15, at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds gonna come in handy. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented these guys to Nebuchadnezzar and the king talked with them and he found none equal to Daniel and his friends. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and chanters in his whole kingdom. They were the top of the class. And Daniel remained there, verse 21 until the first year of King Cyrus. I need to tell you this, chapter one covers 70 years of history. You just need to know that. We're gonna talk about it here in a second. Daniel remained 70 years in this culture as an exile. Not angry, not fighting the culture, not isolated from the culture, and certainly didn't assimilate to the culture, but he lived as an engaged exile in the culture in a way that had influence from the time he was 15 until he's 85. And his influence literally was something that went right to the top levels of government. As a follower of Christ, we are called to live the life of an exile in our culture. Russell Moore says this, our call is to an engaged alienation, a Christianity that preserves the distinctiveness of our gospel while not retreating from our calling as neighbors friends, and citizens. Listen, friends, if you're a follower of Christ, we might not be in a real Babylon, but can we at least say that there's a metaphorical one? That, that we live in a culture that is less and less attuned to God, sometimes dismissive of him, sometimes minimizing him, sometimes hostile to him, 
And the church is trying to find its way and Christians are trying to find his way. And the temptation is to fight that culture. Or the temptation is to flee that culture, and isolate from it. Or can I say this? The temptation is just to fit in with the culture. And yet what God calls us to is not to fight it, not to flee it, not just to fit in, but to follow Jesus as an engaged alien in a way that has influence in that culture. How? Let me give you three or four things here from, from Daniel 1, just as a way of introducing this conversation. First is this, how can you and I engage our culture following Jesus into it? First, we're gonna decide, like Daniel, to take God at his word no matter what. We're gonna decide to take God at his word no matter what. This was Daniel's response to Babylonia's intimidation. They were trying to make Daniel's God seem weak and impotent, maybe even irrelevant, and Daniel decided to take God at his word no matter what. Guys, think about this. Engage with me for a minute. Daniel decided to take God at his word even though his own king, the king of Judah, Jehoiakim, didn't. His own leader, his own king, burned the scriptures when presented with them, Jeremiah 36. Daniel decided to take God at his word even when it seemed like it wasn't working. You ever, you ever felt like that? Like I'm trusting God and can you imagine what Daniel saw? Like the Babylonian empire ripped these young guys out of their homes. And Daniel as a teenager is watching this and he's like, I don't know. And he decides to take God at his word even though it seems like, I don't know that it's working out that well. He decides to take God at his word, even though when he gets to Babylon, he's presented with fresh and new ideas. Fresh and new ideas that maybe your God's outdated. Maybe these new things are things that you ought to pay attention to. You're saying, Dan, how do you know he took God at his word? Well, look at some, uh, you can circle these things in your Bible. Because when Daniel's telling the story, there's this ribbon throughout it. Verse 2. He says this, God is the one who's working. It was the Lord who delivered Jehoiakim. Verse nine, God caused the official to show favor. Verse 17, God gave knowledge and understanding. Daniel's like this, as history is unfolding, I know God is doing something. He's working and so I'm gonna trust him. This is the critical crossroads that all followers of Jesus must and will face. When a majority of the people reject it, when leaders and influential people will mock it, when society offers new things, some of y'all are going to college and your professors are mocking this old literature that, that you would even think about trusting God in his word, right? It's exactly what Daniel finds himself in. We live in a culture where it's like, you know, I'm not sure God's working out that well. It looks like he might be losing, right? And the critical crossroads is this. Well, I trust him and believe him. That's exactly where Daniel's at. Listen, I can't, I can't determine to trust what he says if, ready? I don't know what he says. If I don't... I can't trust his plan. I'm gonna panic if I don't know his plan because I, I can't trust his plan. So I'm like, what's happening? What was it that Daniel trusted? Well, he trusted a passage in the book of Jeremiah. This would have been something Daniel would have known of. It's something that some of you have on your walls. It's something that many people quote many times out of context because this familiar passage in Jeremiah is couched right in Daniel's story. Jeremiah 29, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for, for Babylon, I'll come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. Verse 11, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. It's right in the middle of this Babylonian captivity. Daniel's like, I know. Then you'll call on me and come and pray to me and I'll listen to you. You'll seek me and find me. And when you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. And I'll bring you back from captivity. I'll gather you from all the nations and places where I've banished you and will bring you back to the place 
from which I carried you into exile. Daniel knew that. Even though his king rejected it, even though he's being presented with fresh ideas, even though it looked like everything was falling apart, he knew that God said, I have a plan and I'm working the plan. Not only that, on the other hand, I would say, I would say this, it's easy in our culture to wag our finger and say, all that we see happening in, in culture is God's judgment on culture. Don't miss in the story here who God is disciplining. Who's he disciplining? His people. Sometimes the church can tend to wag and say, you know, God's judgment is... I love what Russell Moore says. Look at what he says. He says, the shaking of American culture is no sign that God has given up on American Christianity. In fact, it may be a sign that God is rescuing American Christianity from itself. Daniel determined to trust God and take him at his word no matter what. Even though his leader didn't, even though new ideas, even though it looked like everything was coming apart, he knew what God had to say, and so he was trusting God's at work. Second thing, in response to isolation, Daniel got in a huddle with his buddies. And I would say it this way, that, that the way for us to respond as engaged aliens is to choose, and I'm choosing my words carefully here, choose to embrace biblical, missional community. Choose to embrace. He stuck with his three friends. You can see that ribbon throughout this story. These boys stick together. They huddled together to help each other. It reminds me of what Hebrews 10 says. It says to us, living in maybe metaphorical Babylon, right? Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. He's like, I'm going to take him at his word. And then he says this, let's consider how we can spur one another on to love and good deeds. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, don't give up meeting together. As some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, look here a second. I, I want to say something. I've heard preachers use this passage to make people feel guilty in the middle of the coronavirus here for, for not coming back to physical church. Silly application of this. Some of you are watching this because you're vulnerable and you're in that age bracket, you got health issues. I think that's a silly application of this. It creates unnecessary guilt and division. But I wanna talk frankly about this, this whole idea of connecting, whether virtually or live, with a community that is biblical and missional is not a rule to keep. It is all about relationships we need as exiles. Isn't it easy to lose the habit? He says, don't give up the habit. For, can you be honest? During this time, it can be easy to lose the habit. It can be easy to lose the consistency. And I think what Daniel shows us is this. It's not just a rule. I came, I checked it off, but we need each other. Some of you are watching this. You can, I've heard from you this week. You've emailed me. You cannot wait to get back because you so long for community. We need each other. Parents, I'm just gonna to talk to you for a second. Your children and your teenagers need biblical, missional community. Sometimes we can be more concerned that they make the team that, than that they have a huddle of people who are following Christ with them through this culture and that they're building healthy, biblical, missional relationships. Your teenagers, your children need consistently to be connecting with biblical community, missional community. But, there's a big but here, but coming to church, showing up to youth group, to young adult group, is not the ends to escape our culture. Some people go to church like, oh, I just need to escape. That's not what coming to church is about. It's not the ends. Going to youth group is not the ends to escape 
the big bad culture, coming to church, connecting with the youth ministry, the young adult ministry, your grace group, more and more group, whatever it might be, participating is simply a means to equip, encourage, so that you can engage with the culture. Here's what I know about these Hebrew boys. They didn't huddle at the expense of engaging their culture, but they dare not engage their culture without huddling. They go hand in hand. You see, I chose my words carefully because there's a difference between simply becoming part of a small group that wants to escape all the crazy stuff going on in the world and a biblical missional community that wants to encourage, equip, so that we can engage our culture for the glory of God and the gospel of Jesus. We're gonna choose to embrace. I would say this, not only that, but we're gonna dare to live from God's alternative story in the middle of culture's predominant story. Daniel and his three friends chose to live from an alternative story. It goes back to that Jeremiah 29 passage. Here's what God said, and Daniel knew this. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So, so Daniel's like, okay, I'm going to live from God's alternative story here. Build houses. Settle down. Plant gardens. Eat what they produce. Marry, have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Seek the peace and prosperity of the city. That's interesting to me, to which I've carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Don't let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Don't listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. These, they are prophesying lies to you in my name. I've not sent them, declares the Lord. You see what he says? They're living from this alternative story. He's saying, don't isolate. Don't, don't sit around and whine. Oh, we're in Babylon, right? He says, build you some houses. Get married, have some babies. And then he says this, when you get where you're going, I'll work for you. God says, I'll work for you and you work for the welfare of the people there. Here's the secret to living from an alternative story. Daniel and his friends never forgot who they were. The Babylonians tried to rename them, but when you read the story of Daniel, when Daniel refers to himself, he refers to himself as Daniel. What? God is my judge. He knew exactly who he was. In a culture that tried to re-identify him, he's like, no. I know exactly who I am. And when I know who I am, I'll know what to do. I'm going to tell you something. You already know this. We live in a culture that wants to re-identify you. You are what you do. You are the success that you've had. You are the party you're a part of. You are, you fill in the blank. And if you're a follower of Christ, you are first and foremost, you are first and foremost who God says you are. I'm not first and foremost pastor, I first and foremost am a child of God who happens to be a pastor. See how it works? I'm a trophy of grace, right? That's what he says, that, that, that I'm not what culture says, I'm not what others say, but I am who he says I am. I, at the risk of, I just wanna to talk to you, we're, we're going into an interesting political season. <laughs> And some of you are like, I'm a Republican, and I'm a Democrat, and I'm an Independent, and I'm a Republican, and what, I don't know what you are, right? And our world during this time wants to identify you. What are you? And I'm going to tell you something. That's, that's our culture saying, what are you? What are you? What are you? I'm a child of God, first and foremost. I follow a king. His name is Jesus, first and foremost. Russell Moore says this. He says, we're Americans best. You ready? When we are not Americans first. Boy, that is powerful. Parents, I, I wanna talk to you for a second. Daniel and his friends are teenagers. 
And the king of Judah burned the word of God. Where did they learn who they were? Where did they learn to live out of God's alternative story? I'd love to meet Daniel's mom and dad. Somewhere these teenagers learn that. And you know how what happens when you know who you are, you know what you do? Do you see? They knew what to say no to. He's like, no, I don't want the king's food. I don't want to buy into the Babylonian way. I'm not going to defile myself. They knew how to respond with conviction. But you see this? But they didn't fight about everything. They didn't fuss about the Babylonians calling them by a different name. They didn't resist the schooling and education. In fact, they embraced it. They were at the top of their class. Listen, I think Daniel and his friends are a picture of wise conviction. They knew how to say no to the right things and they knew how to say it with tact and wisdom. And yet they didn't simply fight about everything, but they became the top in their class. They pursued this education so that when they stood in front of the king, they were the most well-versed. See, how could they do that? Well, they decided to live from God's alternative story in the middle of a predominant story because they knew who they were. Which leads to the last thing, and we're done for today. I think the last thing is this, is that we're gonna determine to practice the presence of God for the long haul. In the middle of a society that tried to enculturate them, Daniel and his three friends, now, now get this, I'm gonna blow this story for some of you. They practiced the presence of God for over 70 years. Chapter one ends with him, King Cyrus is now in charge. Daniel is probably 85. The story starts, he's 15. At the end of the chapter, he's 85. Story starts, he sees Jehoiakim burning the word of God, Nebuchadnezzar taking over, trying to isolate them, intimidate them, and culturate them. When the story ends, we're gonna get here in, in a few weeks, he's 85 years old. Some of you, the only thing you know about Daniel is he was thrown in the lion's den. That's chapter six. And when you think about that story, you think about teenage Daniel being thrown in the lion's den. Do you realize he's about 80 to 85 years old when they throw him in the lion's den? <laughs> I mean, the lions might be in a secondary worry for him. Maybe breaking a hip was the, was, the, was the primary. I don't know, right? Right? Here's the deal. How did he maintain influence without assimilating? What was the secret to Daniel's long obedience? How did he live a life of no compromise in the tyranny of a majority opinion? What was the secret to him doing this into his 80s? I will tell you this. This is interesting to me about the story of Daniel. What's interesting about the story of Daniel is much of what you read in this book is highlights of his life. But for 70 years, I want you to remember this. Daniel got up. He shaved. He ate his bowl of fruit. He pulled out the Babylonian times to catch up on the news of the day, and he practiced the presence of God. How did he do that? I think we get a hint in Daniel 6, verse 10. It says, when Daniel learned the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened up toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Guys, I think the secret is this. Instead of panicking and protesting every time there was a change of administration, and there was no vote for the change of administration, they just kind of took over. And Daniel lasted through four of them. The book of Daniel goes through four of them. Instead of doing that, what Daniel did was he practiced the habits that drew him closer into the God who was present. He practiced the habits of prayer practice the habits of listening to God and talking to God that would draw him closer to the God that he knew was present and was writing this story. And he huddled with others who were living out of that same alternative story. That's the secret to a long obedience. And that's the secret to how a follower of Christ lives in a culture without being conformed by it, but lives in a way that they engage with it in order to have influence in that culture. 
some of you are watching this and you're not a follower of Christ. And I'm so glad you're watching this. You know, the, stand, the, the story of Daniel isn't just this example to follow, but it's a picture of a bigger story. It's a picture of a bigger story that actually points to Jesus. Because the story of Jesus tells us this, is that we have a God who didn't simply stay isolated, but he engaged he engaged us, and when it seemed like he was losing, they killed Jesus. He was actually winning. What was he winning? When Jesus died, he died on the cross for your sins and mine so that we could be forgiven of our sin and be part of the family of God. And so the story of Daniel is simply this picture of a bigger story of a God who loves us of a God who entered our world in order that he might do the work necessary for our welfare so that we could have a relationship with him. My prayer is this, if you've never said yes to Jesus, that you would make that most important decision to say yes to a God who loves you and did everything necessary so that you could be forgiven of your sins and be called a child of God. God, story of Daniel. It's going to be a fun journey. And I pray for those who are followers of Christ that you would teach us what it means to be engaged exiles in the middle of the world in which we live. And God, I certainly pray for those who might be listening who've never said yes to Jesus, that they would recognize, embrace, and say yes to your invitation of grace found in Christ, and that they would make that most important step and become part of the family of God and receive the gift of forgiveness of their sins. I love you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for joining us for the weekend experience. I hope that the message spoke to you specifically, and I really hope that it challenged you because it challenged me for sure. And I would love for you to take this opportunity to maybe share this with someone that you think could benefit from hearing this. And maybe take it a step further and go ahead and dialogue about the conversation and see how you can take the opportunity that you have right now to be involved in the community around you and not just be a bystander, but to jump into this moment that we are living in. And speaking of jumping into community, I would love for you, if you have not yet, to take a step toward discovery groups, which are starting this Wednesday at 7 p.m. And these are all gonna be virtual this time around, so it's gonna be extremely fun. And you can sign up for that on our website at norton.gracechurches.org. And I wanted to thank all of you who do so faithfully give through Grace Church and getting the gospel further, faster. Thank you for your gifts and your investment in that way. If you want to figure out more about how to do that and give through grace, you can do that online or through text giving, or if you come here in person, you can also have that option as well. Hey, I hope you have a great rest of your week. We'll see you next time. Welcome to Grace Church. <laughs>